historically has gone to the combo deck. And Todd be on the play. Starts off on a basic planes. Looks like on a mulligan to six here. And Knight of the Reliquary. So Ghost Quarter and planes here. Only two lands, nothing green. Yeah, it looks like six cards both on both sides. Todd can quarter himself because he has a third land in hand. It's a copy of Gavany Township. We see for Jake, it's going to be turn two, Chalice of the Void on one, off to pair of Urza's Towers. Now, Chalice of the Void is not actually a problem for Todd's deck. Well, it is for some of the interactive elements. It does have four Path to Exile. Um, yeah. There's some mana creatures as well. Right, but this, at this point, now that he didn't have a turn one mana creature, it's not going to do too much damage. So Todd has to make this Ghost Quarter play. So you see here, he taps white and colorless, so then Ghost Quarters the Gavany Township for a forest and plays Knight of the Reliquary. Uh, not pretty, but it does get the card onto the board. And with Perala is leading on double tower, the Ghost Quarter doesn't look like it's going to matter a ton against the lands that he's being presented. So using it to fix his mana, not as bad as it can be in this kind of game. Yeah. Well, keep in mind, there's another Ghost Quarter in Todd's hand, and now he has a Knight of the Reliquary on the board, so he could just Ghost Quarter Jake every turn. Yeah, 4-4 four, four Knight's pretty good tier 2, and that's just going to keep growing. Looks like Eldrazi Temple in Paralysis' hand. We'll play that. Is it going to be Thought Not Seer? It is. He'll get a card out of Todd's hand. We see second Knight of the Reliquary. Tarmogoyf and a Path to Exile. Well, certainly not taking Path. Right, and hitting the second Knight is pretty significant. Yeah, and this is going to be interesting, right, because Todd's Knight of the Reliquary actually is going to outsize Thought Not Seer almost immediately. Yes. And with that Chalice on one in hand, uh, or uh, on the table, Paralos actually can't set up a Basilisk Caller. But he's able to get it, one of his Karns, um, use something like uh, Ugin the Spirit Dragon as all his dust, he can clean up the Knight of the Reliquary that way. Right, but that all requires, the interesting thing is that requires him to get to big mana, and with Knight of the Reliquary and Ghost Quarters in Todd's deck, that's going to be hard for him to do. Yeah, uh, and there are only two basic wastes in the Eldrazi Tron deck. And which I'm sure, a fact that Todd, I'm sure, is aware of. Right. So he ends up selecting the second Knight of the Reliquary. Todd draws, picks up a scavenging ooze. So we'll see what Todd's strategy is here with regards to, to lands and a now an active knight. Mm -hmm. Looks like he's not going to ghost quarter just yet. Cast Tarmogoyf using his ghost quarter. Make that scavenging ooze, leaving up planes. Right now, Knight of the Reliquary, a 4-4. The fact that the cost on activating Nether Reliquary is sacrificing a forest or plains, and the fact that Paralas has access to basic waste to find with the Ghost Quarter, makes it pretty uninviting to start sacrificing your mana producing lands to just yeah. convert your opponent's lands into other lands. So Paralysis' draw that turn was a copy of Endbringer. If he can get one more Eldrazi Temple, he could play that this turn. Certainly it's a co the, one of the big late game cards that he'd like to get onto the table. Mm -hmm. That one's a difficult one for Knight to deal with. Instead, he'll go for another Thought Not Seer. That's going to exile away the Tarmogoyf, leaving Todd with an uncastable path to exile. It's unresolvable. <laughs> sure, okay. You can cast into the Chalice and hope Jake misses, but uh, Jake seems to be aware of what's going on. End step, Todd will go ahead and sacrifice that Plains, floating a white mana. He can get a land of his choice out of the deck. Looks like he's just going to continue to fill up the graveyard. Gets a fetch land, then uses the fetch land to go get another dual land. So, into Temple Garden. Now the Relic right now up to a 6-6. Six, six. And Stevens does not have a main deck Kasali Pride Mage. Uh, so at some point, if he's going to do anything with this path to exile, it's going to be playing into the Chalice and hope it resolves. Yeah, there's no way to hit Chalice off the board here. Mm -hmm. So Steven's drawing off the top. Last card not going to be castable this game. He does have the largest creature, though, in Knight of the Reliquary. And it's just going to keep growing. You see him drawing Horizon Canopy there. Going to draw a card off that using Ghost Quarter. Hits a Windswept Heath. So, so Knight's just huge at this point. Mm -hmm. Already we have uh, it up to 5-5. Five, five. It is problematic for Stevens that there's no food for the Scoos. That's just a 2-2. Two, two. Yeah, he'd like to get that up to a 5-5 five, five as well, or at least 4. Draw for Paralysis. He's looking for lands. Has right now 
three Urza's Towers and an Eldrazi Temple. Any land here will let him have Endbringer. But does not hit the land. It's going to be Mattery Shaper and pass. Todd continues to take the lands out of his deck. Sacrificing Forest into Windswept Heath into Temple Garden. So the knight continues to grow, but Stevens needs to do more than just control Knight of the Reliquary to pull ahead in this game. Right. I mean, if you look at Paralysis' board, I mean, he can do things like Chump Block with Mattery Shaper. The ground doesn't isn't an inviting place for damage. Mm -hmm. And the top of Paralysis' deck has much more potential than Stevens. Well, good draw here for Todd. He draws another Knight of the Reliquary, and that could do something. Now that he has two large creatures... One can attack, one can block. Right. Now, he still has to be worried about something like all his dust. Mm -hmm. Really no coming back on that one. He can't play around it either, though. Just has to jam and hope for the best. So now he will attack with one of the Knights of the Reliquary. Seven lands in the yard means this is a 9-9. Nine -nine. If Jake wants to kill it, it will take his entire team. Todd will draw two cards. That's probably not a go. Just throw the Mattery Shaper, and that'll replace itself. That's the play. What does he get off the top? It is Expedition Map. Ooh. And that's really strong. It goes into play. Well, it actually does go into play. Who said it gets countered by Chalice? But uh, we'll look at Mattery Shaper here for a second. It is one of the ways to get one drops into play. And Jake can sacrifice it on end step. That's really good. Yeah. Finds an Eldrazi Temple, so we'll be able to cast some pretty expensive spells here. Yeah, so it says because this, you say you may put that card onto the battlefield. It doesn't say you may cast it. Mm -hmm. So that's why we see that being able to go into play. Jake can't miss that. He tried to put it into his graveyard. It's on Todd to say, well, you could choose to put it into your hand, but yeah. you can't put it into your graveyard. The game does not allow you to just put cards in your <laughs> graveyard willy-nilly. Right, so Todd corrects. He says, well, you can't go to your graveyard with that. And then Jake says... Oh, well, how about the battlefield? Yeah, that's fine. That one plays. So now he's up to seven mana if he wants it with that Eldrazi temple he found. So he actually has enough mana for something like all his dust. Maybe Endbringer. He... His Eldrazi finishers are online at this point. Yep, still not able to cast something like a car and Liberated, though the deck isn't super heavy on those. It has more copies of Endbringer. And here is Endbringer for Perales. Pretty aptly named. Yeah, so we'll take a look at this, as it's a card that can really keep some of this Knight of the Reliquary at bay. Endbringer untaps each turn. It can tap to deal a damage. It can pay a colorless to make a creature not be able to attack or block. And for two colorless, it can draw a card. Mm -hmm. Todd can try to end this game quickly. A swing of two knights. Uh, one chump block from Jake. Counts lands here. Eight in the yard. With Ghost Corner play, if he didn't block either, he would take 20. Can't have that. <laughs> yeah, so put a thought on front of one of them. Looks like he takes 10. Todd will draw. Draws Birds of Paradise. And another one mana spell. That doesn't really do much. Mm -hmm. It helps him grow the scavenging ooze. Right. Just play it and get it countered. And Todd will keep going to work on the creatures in Jake's graveyard. Now, Endbringer is does eventually pull away. You see Birds of Paradise, it gets countered, that's fine by Todd, it means Scavenging Goose can eat it. Up to a 5-5, five, five. now big enough to hit through a Thought Knot. Mm -hmm. So Perales, I guess he gets draw cards with Endbringer and try to hit that all is dust, something like that. A little bit choked on mana to make that happen. Um, yeah, we can't... See. There's no land in his deck that gets him to 10 for Ulamog on the following turn. Certainly not with this Ghost Quarter happening. Right. Ghost Quarter will turn a temple into a Wastes. I mean, it would have to be something like draw a card, untap both his guys, untap his guy, draw another card, chump away his team, all is dust. So, you right. know, it's, it wouldn't, he would pay a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, in the main, there's only one copy of all is dust also. So it's not, he's not drawing to that. The cards he's drawing to are not particularly powerful. Ten tens are hard for this deck to deal with. Unlike traditional Tron, 
this deck is not full of O stones and Karns. Mm. And when Thought Not Seer is on chump blocking to, uh, duty, it is a uh, very poor magic card. Right. So Matter Reshaper, Thought Not Seer, and a pass. Now there's a card that's tailor made for chump blocking. Yeah. <laughs> I'm interested about playing Thought Knot. I kind of, I'm, it's like close as to whether or not that's better than just drawing a card with Endbringer and untapping. Mm -hmm. Todd gonna swing two, maybe three. I mean, both knights have to be blocked. Scavenging Ooze swings. It, so we'll see where Perales goes with this. Yeah, I, I did want to see, I think I wanted to see Endbringer drawing some cards here, especially if Jake's looking for something to stabilize him. You know, get that Ulamog. Yep. You don't have to sell me on drawing extra cards. All right. Both of the Knights of the Reliquary are lethal here. The Scavenging Ooze is not, but stands at 5-5 five, five with no other creatures in the yard. There's a triple block available on the knight, but that would cost Perales his Endbringer, and that's probably a non-starter for lines of play. Two chump blocks. Looks like three chump blocks are Perales. He's going to give Todd that third card. Oh, okay. Actually, Endbringer plus Thought Knot can kill Scavenging Ooze here. So... Jake loses three creatures. Todd actually does lose ooze. Mattery Shaper turns into the fourth Thought Knot. Todd will draw a company voice voice. Yeah. That is a lot of action. And collect the company is really good here. It potentially shuts off the outs that Perales even has. Yeah, the all is dust doesn't, who knows anymore. Ulamog, the draw for Perales. I don't think, I think it's called the Ceaseless Hunger. Uh, not. I, you know, <laughs> I, I do like Eldrazi Tron, but I'll say something. I never see them get Tron, okay? They're just like, he has six lines, like, yeah, I always have uh, three towers, a temple, a waste, it's a ghost quarter. And I see them win games, too, so it's not like a knock on the deck. It's just When I watch other people play it, yes. When they play against me, they have it. Okay. <laughs> Collected Company on Steps gets Tarmogoyf and Tireless Tracker from Todd. This is some pretty good finds. So there's, this is this neat thing happening with Greenit where Todd's creature is just outsizing Jake's. Mm -hmm. um, even though Perales is the ramp deck, that doesn't matter. Uh, if he doesn't have that big sweeper, that O-Stone or all his dust, mm -hmm. then he's not going to win this match. I needed to get some better lands to make that Ulamog happen. And Stevens presented the ability to ghost quarter Perales four times. So it's really hard to make that happen in the face of that. Courser of Krufix from Todd Stevens. Courser Tracker is a combo. You have to I have do lands. like that, yeah, which he doesn't. But <laughs> he does have some... I mean, I guess it's because he's, he's gotten most of them out of his deck. Right. Now you're the Relic, are going to sacrifice a forest to go get a different land? Yeah, the Embringer doesn't want it to attack, and Steven says, that's fine. I'll this card has other else. text. And I'll get a life and a clue, and another life point and another clue. I have not gotten the opportunity. I've played Tyler's Tracker and Oracle of Moldai at the same time. That's pretty neat. That's a combo. Um, I haven't got to do it with Corsair of Crucifix yet. It looks, but this makes me want to. <laughs> More clues and lands. Todd still has chances to find a land on top of his deck. He'll play it off Courser if he can. Yep. Revealing Courser, not ideal, but still fine. He's in such a good position already. Cracks a clue. Counter on Tyler's Tracker. Draws Courser. Tarmogoyf waiting. More damage in. Now Jake's gonna, he goes down to two. He's just gonna need that Need all his dust, really. Yep, not even Ulamog does it at this point. It just deals with two of these creatures. All of them are lethal. There are five. He only has one other creature. And we'll see, did he hit the card? He has enough mana to cast it, thanks to that Eldrazi Temple. Thanks. 
Endbringer can draw him a card. He'll do that. But that is going to be it. So Todd Stevens with Green White Company takes the first game over Eldrazi Tron. And normally when you see Green White versus Ramp, you know, I, I don't look at Knight of the Reliquary and think this is a card that's going to be good against Ramp decks. I expect him to outclass it. But what we saw there is Todd's Knight of the Reliquary actually outclassed Jake's deck. Yeah. And Knight of the Reliquary, when your opponent is not either comboing or casting efficient removal spells, can really steal games. All right, so we're going to look at the sideboard. I want to look at Jake Perales' side first. One of the things he kind of he suffered from there was not having enough late game to power through. So there's... Are there a couple things he can do to address that? Mm -hmm. uh, so the sideboard is four Surgical Extraction, three Dragon's Claw, two Ratchet Bomb, two Dismember, a Pithing Needle, a Batter Skull, an All is Dust, and a Crucible of Worlds. The All is Dust is great if he had that at most of that first game. That card would be excellent. There's a strong argument for Batter Skull. It helps him keep pace with the size of the opposing creatures. Gaining some life would be good as well. Dismember to deal with Nine of the Reliquary. That's great. Ratchet Bomb a little slow, but serves the same purpose. Um, Less good than the Dismember, but still good. And there's a pretty reasonable argument to play Crucible of Worlds against this Ghost Quarter heavy deck. Yeah, so it's Crucible in a defensive way, not an offensive way. Right. Uh, that part makes sense. Uh, looking at Todd Stevens' side, he has some good cards on his own as well. Stony Silence is typically very good against Tron decks. Now, Eldrazi Tron doesn't play all these Chromatic Spheres and Stars, we think it still might be good here. Still plays Expedition Map, Walking Ballista. Uh, Stevens has played a lot of Eldrazi Tron, and he said that it's the most powerful cyborg card that people play against him. Uh, so I suspect that he'll be bringing it in here. Uh, Blessed Alliance is pretty good in most matches where your opponent's playing sizable creatures. That one seems fine. Um, I like the second Crucible of Worlds as well, just to really hammer home that land destruction plan. Yeah. That seems totally fine. The, the Kasali Pride Mage makes sense as well. It can deal with uh, several problematic permanents. Yeah. This matchup, originally I thought this would be tough for Todd. Um, traditional Tron seems like it would be a hard matchup for his deck. But when you look at uh, the decks we have on day two, we have five, four copies of Eldrazi Tron and just one copy of Green Red Tron. If that's the way the big mana decks are looking, then this is a great tournament for Todd. Players make it ready for the second game. We, the winner here should make it into the top eight. Mm -hmm. which on top of getting them into the top of the tournament also qualifies them for the upcoming Invitational. You too can qualify for the Season End Invitational. It's at the end of June by a StarCityGames.com Invitational Qualifiers. These are local tournaments held around the country. They have exclusive prizes to the tournament, including a full $1,000 prize to the top eight and the winner getting a qualification to the in and to the Invitational, the winner and runner-up. Uh, they award SCG points, an exclusive playmat and pin, and you get tokens for registering. So find out location and schedule near you at starcitygames.com slash IQ. Uh, so I've been playing Magic for over 10 years, uh, based out of Minnesota. 1K tournaments have historically been very hard to come by. So these 1K IQs are very nice offerings. If you're from, say, California, you're a little more privileged. But for those of us <laughs> in the Midwest, these tournaments are very nice. Yeah, they'll happen every... Yeah, they're, they're kind of that, that good... It's like the highest you can get at a store level tournament. Right. So, Jake Peral is on the play game two. Sevens on each side starts on Ursa's power plant. You see Todd with that Azusa lost but seeking in hand. Starts on Noble Hierarch. That's a one-up he has in the main. It's very interesting. I, I don't want to say suspect yet, because he, I, we watched him do some powerful things with it. You don't normally see that card in fair decks, but Todd's just doing that this weekend. Mm -hmm. His turn one Noble Hierarch is met with Dismember. Jake down to 16. Also, just if you want to look at how Todd is addressing this matchup, he has his sideboard copy of Whisperwood Elemental in his hand. Now, that card is a card I expect to see against removal-heavy decks, it's really neat that he's boarding in against Eldrazi Tron. It, it certainly shows what he thinks of the matchup. It makes some colorless permanence in the face of all his dust, which is pretty, yeah. it's pretty spicy. Replacement Noble Hierarch from Todd. He has a Ghost Quarter. There's two Tron pieces in play for Jake, but Todd's not going to pull the trigger just yet. 
And I'm a little bit curious about Perales pulling the trigger on Dismember on Noble Hierarch. Bolt the Bird, of course, is something that makes a lot of sense. On turn one, it's really good. Well, yeah. in, in different matchups, if your deck is full of fair cards, then the mana acceleration matter. But Perales is playing all this busted mana acceleration and has bigger payoffs. Yeah, well. I would I would more be more concerned about Night of the Reliquary actually outsizing me than Noble Hierarch accelerating mana. You know, he does have natural Tron in his hands. So he can play the third Tron piece and just into Endbringer. If this is the case, that might change his decisions. Well, Endbringer just gets to Shoot go to Noble Exile. Higher, yeah. right? Well, he doesn't get to do anything in this game. He gets to turn into a basic waste. If he got to untap that, there would just that card would kill birds, draw tons of cards. It'd be pretty great. Now Todd has to decide if he wants to Ghost Quarter a Tron piece. Um, he has no more lands in hand. Mm -hmm. So using Ghost Quarter here is a huge price. But leaving your opponent with Tron, I, I get that he's not a fan of that either. Yeah, and Prowl is pretty fortunate that this member line's paying off because Todd's not producing any more mana sources. So Todd is going to use the Ghost Quarter. He lets Jake draw a card, then Ghost Quarters him, hoping to get the second wastes in Jake's hand. That's not going to happen. Still is left in his deck. So both wastes in play. Prowl's back down to a fair four mana. From here on out, Ghost Quarters are just going to be Stone Rain. They just will destroy a land. Of course, uh, Prowlis has a good number of lands anyway. Yeah. Cast Batter Call says, Batter Skull says go. He did have another Tron piece, but Todd shows correctly as it's in Urza's Power Plant. And Todd paying the price. Uh, no other lands. Jake's going to follow up the Batter Skull with a Reality Smasher, swing for nine. He should easily coast in with this game. Mm hmm. Stevens finally found a second land. It's a ghost quarter. Uh, that's just not going to do it here. So what do you think of this mana denial strategy that got won the game here for Jake? Now, when you're on the play, I, I understand turn one dismembering a Birds of Paradise, a Noble Hierarch. That's almost always correct. The second one shows the strategy he wants to play now. You know, that's the commitment where, okay, he spent all his spells destroying Todd's lands and then forced Todd to use a ghost quarter. It ended up that because Todd had to, you, you know, he just never got to cast any of his cards. I think that if you're dismembering Noble Hierarch with the sort of spell power advantage that this deck has over the Green-White Company deck, you are relying on things going wrong for your opponent. Whereas if you save it for the Night of the Reliquary, one of very few creatures that actually matters out of Steven's deck, you're forcing more things to go right for them. Sure. Do you think the turn one, he still needs to kill the turn one mana creature? Or can we go control enough that you let him resolve all the free drops and just dismember those? Uh, in this in this matchup, my inclination is to sit on the dismembers and wait for the relevant creatures. So, one game apiece. So this is going to be a third deciding game for the two. Winner here should make it into top eight. Now, for those of you guys watching us over on Twitch TV, we broadcast this live. But if you've missed any of the action, that you can catch up on that during the week over at our YouTube page, the stars youtube.com slash Star City Games. We have re full coverage of our weekend events, including the best of SCG Tour matches. We have versus videos from our in-house players playing the top decks of the format in, uh, and explaining their plays against each other in the versus series. We also have our commander players in the commander versus series. Series. That split second magic online playtesting, there's a lot of stuff over at our YouTube page. Mm -hmm. okay, a lot of great qu uh, content to check out there. You could spend many an afternoon on the YouTube channel. So go back to our deciding game now. Jake benefiting a lot there from actually being able to assemble Tron. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having the natural Tron yeah. makes it pretty hard to lose to a green-white creature deck. Well, and I think when you go back and saying green-white company is probably weaker to traditional Tron decks, and it's for the reason we saw there. Um, that kind of start, the three mana into, you know, three, man, three lands Tron into big haymakers is going to be really hard for green-white. The mm -hmm. kind of mid-ranging Tron draws where it's lands into temple, into thought knot, into stuff, if Todd can overpower that. Right. Yeah, the 4-4 Thought Knot Seers in game one were not terribly impressive. No, they, they ch ended up all chump blocking uh, and undrawing Todd cards. It's, it's a pretty weak. Mm -hmm. Against the three-color controlling decks of the format, it's frequently the case where getting hit by Thought Knot Seer uh, and this diverse mana base is actually better. 
Uh, but right. against decks that are capable of outsizing you, uh, like the Eldrazi Tron loses some significant points. Yeah, Smasher and Thought Not Seer are really good against these three color decks. Against green, white, they're just not big enough. Mm -hmm. Todd's threats scale in size. It's, <laughs> you know, Knight. Starts out as a 2-2, but eventually grows to beat up all the Eldrazi. Well, so did Jake's. Walking Ballista. It does. Scale. Equip mm -hmm. Batter Skull. That's a lot more work. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not wrong. And sometimes we see uh, our last Eldrazi Tron player we had on uh, last round was playing two copies of the card Basilisk Caller as a way to kind of if Jake, Jake does not have them in his list, but if he had them, they'd actually be very good here. Right. The idea that you could get Basilisk Collar on a Walking Ballista might say that game game one, right? If Jake put that two-card combo together, uh, I, I don't think Todd can win. Mm -hmm. You should remove one counter to just start killing every creature. Right. Peral is on a mulligan to five here. Now, Tron is a deck that can mulligan very, very well. If you, if you have Tron, it doesn't really... You win the game with cards to spare. Right. Um, the best possible hands are casting cards way ahead of schedule. When we start going down to four, though, I think we see some real problems. Uh, uh, Tron, 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 Ugin. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> sounds silly, but I mean, even there are ways to get there on four cards. Mm hmm in the matchups for the Eldrazi are particularly good. A couple temples uh, can make a four-card hand totally reasonable. Uh, in this matchup, he's likely hinging harder on the actual Urza lands. At this point, a hand of temple, temple, thought not, that's probably not good enough. Mm -hmm. All right, it's kept on four. We'll see what he put together. Starts off on wastes. That's not the sign of a strong mulligan hand. Well, it's not only the weakest land to naturally draw on his deck. He's playing against this four Ghost Quarter, four Path to Exile deck as well. And he only has two basics in his entire deck. You were hoping to get this card out of your deck for free, not actually draw it. Exactly. Also, it suggests that he has no other lands in hand. Mm -hmm. So imagine he would lead on just about anything else. Now, the next question is whether or not Todd's hand is serviceable. Does it play? And one of the things that's going to be really rough here for Jake uh, you see Crucible of Worlds in Todd's hand. And on and the other side. side Ghost Quarter. <laughs> yeah. So he's going to go to work here. The turn two Tarmogoyf as well. So Walking Ballista on one, the play for Perales. And, ooh, and <laughs> Azusa lost, but seeking. We got the this, combo. This is, gonna be, this is good. Oh, how about Stony Silence, too? This is reasonable. I like this Azusa. I, I like Azusa as a card. Just always putting in an honest day's work. <laughs> uh, so I've talked to Todd a little bit about this card, and it, it's the initial impression you get. Azusa is a 1 or a 10 in this deck, and this is one of those games where it's going to be a 10. So even if he doesn't have the fourth land, he's going to play Crucible here. It's no problem. Next turn, he taps 2, floats 2 mana, Ghost Quarters himself, Casts Azusa, plays the Ghost Quarter out of the yard, plays the Ghost Quarter out of the yard. Thanks for playing. Yeah. Swing for one from Jake. He, he doesn't He doesn't know what's about to happen, and it's going to be real bad for him. Yep. Draw. Oh, another Ghost Quarter for Todd. That's, sure. That makes it easy. We don't have to Ghost Quarter ourselves anymore. Now he can just Ghost Quarter Jake three times. Play Azusa. Yeah, this is going to be great. Azusa lost but seeking. Uh, ghost Quarter, that's land one. Uh, quarter, one of your lands. Okay. Uh, ghost Quarter, that's land number two. The Ghost Quarter, one of your lands. Oh, you're out of basics. All right. Sweet. <laughs> Old strip Ooh. mine crucible lock. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, this is like when you have it with two explorations. This is this is good. This is some real vintage magic here. Oh, as we see yeah, a yeah, do it again. colorless yeah, deck do it again. with lands that tap for three versus strip mine crucible. <laughs> I can play three lands a turn, and one of them just destroys your land. Fast bond in, in play for Stevens. Jake's going to play this for as many turns as he needs to, as he wants to put up with it. But these two cards on the board, the Ballista and the Matter Shaper, they are the only cards that Jake is going to have cast for the rest of the game. So unless he plans on dealing 17 with these two cards. Yeah. 
Jake already had the misfortune of mulliganing to four cards, and then Stevens just does this to him. Don't let anyone tell you that Azusa is not great in every deck. <laughs> Gonna dismember the Azusa. Okay, that had to happen. Yeah. I don't. Now it means he gets to ah, still. I mean, so now instead of three ghost quarters per turn, it's it's one. Well, he already That's has the fine. ghost yeah. quarter in play, and he has the one in the grave. Oh, doesn't even need the one in play because Crucible will just let him rebuy it anyway. Well, the one in play means he can do two ghost quarters this turn. Yeah. He wouldn't be able to do that if there was only one. Correct. So you can get both the remaining lands. Yep, ghost quarter, uh, ghost quarter. Okay, you're out of lands. Cool. Stony silence. Sure. Turn that ballista off. Creature land in graveyard. It's a three-four time where if it can block. And you don't have to worry about uh, mattery about walking ballista finishing off the timer wave in combat. Well, first of all, because it would put an artifact and into the yard. But second of all, because it, stony silence happened. Here comes Swords to Plowshares out of the Crucible Strip Mine deck. Yeah, you think you can go get a basic, huh? Oh, or not. There goes Mattery Shaper. There goes the land again. Uh, Tarmogoyf will swing for four. Some good, clean magic happening here. Jake's down to... I think... I like that if Jake doesn't concede here, Todd can go for the, the perfect finish. See, he can path the Ballista, and then he can win. He can do no permanence in play. I'm a big fan of that. <laughs> What did you do? I answered all their cards. I guess it's not the full perfect. Jake still has cards in hand. Yeah. I'd like to, you know, ideally, you'd have the death cloud effect where you get everything. Lands, life total, creatures, you're cards pretty, in hand. You're a pretty greedy individual. If you're going to go for it, you know, <laughs> let's... Have you, not, have you done that one when you, you win with a death cloud and you get everything? They end up with zero life, zero cards, zero creatures, zero lands. Yeah. It's a very set. There's, a very, there's like this clean feel to it. You, you know, know, you're like, I, d I did it. I got it all. No, I have not. I played death cloud and extended, and I death clouded for enough every time. This perfect nonsense, it doesn't do it for me. I mean, the thing to do it, uh, the X damage from death cloud has to kill them as well. <laughs> That's the You know, you need to just actually get everything. And that's going to be the handshake. Todd Stevens, Green White Company, wins on table one. And at 12 and 1, he's going to be the first player in the top eight. Really good work by Stevens here. This Green White Company deck, it really looks like something.